UAW 3303, this is your meeting. This is your future. This is the future of Butler. This is the future of the United States of America when it comes to products that we need. I am tired of us shipping jobs overseas and hoping that somehow we'll get a benefit from it. So it's time for us to stand up. So before we start, Commissioner Oshi is going to give an opening prayer. Well, first of all, welcome, and this is, um, this is really awesome. I mean awesome. This may be the most people I've ever seen in this room at one time. So um, congratulations to all of you for this. So let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for an awesome community and an awesome country that we can, as citizens, gather together from all walks of life and from all all, all our many differences, but we unite together as a community. And we give you thanks that we're able to gather here this evening and we ask your blessing on everybody here and on all those who make the critical decisions in our country and in our community about things that affect our lives. And we, we are just grateful uh, to you for all of the blessings that you bestow on us here, that we have such an amazing uh, workforce here in this community, in this county, in this amazing plant. Um, we are grateful for Cliffs. We are grateful for the UAW 3303. We are grateful for all of those uh, community members, businesses, individuals, um, everyone who supports all of those things that are truly valuable to all of us here and for the jobs that sustain us, sustain our lives, sustain our families, and sustain our future. So we ask that you bless this meeting this evening, that you empower each and every one of us to use our voice, to use our, our feet, to use our minds, to use our hearts, to your will and to your goodwill and to the, the good of our own country, our nation, our, our community. We ask you all this in your name, amen. Okay, if everybody please stand. We're gonna do the Pledge of the Flag. Ray Flew, the Vice President of 3303, UAW, we'll give the pledge. That was, that was Ray, come on over here with me. Now it is now it is on? Yes. It's on? Okay. No, it's still not on. That sounds like it's on. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands tonight that coming after the 40 days and the celebration of Easter, this is not a political rally. This has nothing to do whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, a libertarian, that has nothing to do with that. It does have to do with our country. And the fact that if it is to be, it is up to me, it is up to you, it is up to us. Already a million and a half men and women in uniform have given their lives to protect this. I would just like any of the veterans in the audience tonight, please stand up so we can thank you for your service. Also, any Gold Star parents who have lost a son or daughter defending this incredible country, if you could please stand up. Okay. Now, when I go into D.C., I tell people, you can't be in my district. You can't be in the district that I represent and knock on any door where you're not going to be talking to a veteran 
the mother or father of a veteran, a grandfather, whatever. We are veteran rich because we have never ever walked away from our responsibilities as citizens of this incredible experiment in self-governing. Tonight is a really good night for us to show up and so people that would understand these things can't happen in America. We won't sit back and let jobs be taken from us. We will not sit back and lose our national security. We will not sit back and let anything happen. This is a wrong-headed decision. This rule must be pulled down. The key to this, this is not legislature. This didn't go through the House. This didn't go through the Senate. When you start to realize that stuff, then you say, my gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So the only thing I will tell you is this, there's been so much time in my life that's been spent going by that mill. All the kids I grew up with, all the guys I had really the, the honor to play with, uh, our mothers and fathers, our grandfathers and, and great-grandfathers, you know what made this company the way it is? It's people, people that were harder than the steel that they made. So there's times like this that we come together as the American people and say, no, not on our watch. We're not letting this happen. Now, Jamie is with me today. Jamie Sidecheck is with me because I mean, this is about the UAW 3303. And this is why, I'm, listen, you all know this. People make promises to you. If I don't see it on paper with the ink dried, I don't believe it. I'll be glad to support any policy that comes forward as long as it protects American security and American jobs. That's what we're here for tonight. I want you to understand that it's not about me. It is about you. It is about this country. It is about these men and women that serve in this incredible union. So at this point, Jamie, would you please come up and let everybody know what's going on? I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. Thank, thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And I want to give a shout out to everybody who, who got the word and showed up in red. As, as Mike said, this is, not a, uh, this is not a political event. The red is not a political statement. What it is, and I'm going to read to you uh, what this is. So it's, it's recognizing that union members who wear red shirts on specified days is a sign of solidarity. A lot of the shirts out there uh, that we're giving out tonight say solidarity on the back. When a sea of red shirts greets an organization, it's a way to let them know that the workers stand together. This modern tradition goes back to 1989 when the Communication Workers of America, the CWA, whose members wearing red shirts on Thursdays to commemorate the death of one of their own, Jerry Horgan. Horgan was a CWA chief steward for Westchester County in New York who died of head injuries after being struck by a car on a picket line. Wearing the red shirt to show solidarity took on new meaning during Wisconsin's Governor Scott Walker in his relentless attacks on labor in 2011. Unionists around the country wanted to show solidarity with Wisconsin and donned the red shirts once a week. Today, it remains an act of showing unity both to one another and the world. It's not an anti-management, it's not political, it's a positive statement that workers standing together. So for that, I, I thank you all for taking that time. going to take this time now and I think we're going to show our video. That's so okay. Many of you saw it, but I think, I think we're going to play it again. The future of our home is in jeopardy. It would be devastating for this community. Like, it would be dire. We got to do something about it. It's mortifying. The more research I do into this, it's almost scary what, what you learn that's going on. Butler, Pennsylvania is a town of about 13,000 people. It's located 35 miles north of Pittsburgh. It's working class, uh, blue collar all the way. We get it done in Butler County. The Butler Works has been operating here for over 100 years. This plant is the, the very heart and soul of this community. Uh, my grandfather worked at the plant, as did my father, and in many, many families throughout our community. It's generational. We make two types of electrical steel here, non-grain oriented electrical steel, which is like for uh, electric motors, which is the 
the fast growing market, which is for EVs, the secondary and the the more limited and the more refined materials, the grain or electrical steel, and that would be for the chargers, for the charge stations and the charging network. This is one of the, the one of the biggest employers and certainly one of the best paying employers around here. This is a good quality union job. I've worked at the plant coming up on 24 years now. It's been a thriving steel mill since I started. I've never been laid off. At the Butler Works, we were thriving with growing demand for our steel on the horizon. EV markets and electrical infrastructure to support them, fueled by federal dollars, put us on the cusp of a boom. Then out of nowhere, along comes this DOE rule proposal that just pulled the rug out from under our feet. Now, instead of a tremendous growth opportunity, we're looking at a plant closure. We make grain-oriented electrical steel that's used in transformer cores, and the Department of Energy proposed a rule last January that would essentially regulate us out of the market by 2027. The company has already told us that basically if the rule goes as proposed, that uh, our plant will not be viable. It would be an astronomical loss uh, in this community. It would be uh, an, almost an instant economic depression if this was to uh, get enacted and, and force that to, to shut down. You can imagine the impact that a loss of this plant or any decline in this plant would have on our county or municipalities. Um, our businesses, our local business, the manufacturers that support this plant and its operations, our school districts. They say for every one of our jobs, we employ about seven people in the community. Um, if seven people in this community, including us, 1,100 people, that's 7,700 jobs that could be out. Usually we're fighting other countries for, for business, you know, trying to stay competitive and, and, and stay in the market. We need people to be aware of this. You know, you, you have to get behind your legislators and make sure that they're aware. You know, there's a Senate bill. It uh, was introduced by Sherrod Brown of Ohio and co-sponsored by Ted Cruz. And it's, it's a very bipartisan bill. We are asking for common sense legislation and for common sense policies and trade policies that sustain our county and our community and obviously then um, protect our country. It, it, it's a big issue and, and that's why we're screaming at the top of our lungs trying to get it out to everybody that we can talk to, anybody that'll listen to us. You know, this has to be stopped. All right. Well, first of all, wow, what a crowd. I can't say enough for everybody that's here, Congressman Kelly. Thank you for hosting this event and thank your staff for this. I thank all of our local and our state representatives for being here. I thank my family. Uh, I thank my friends. Um, it's really good to have uh, this much turnout and uh, really, really proud of this entire community. So although we're here tonight to talk about a proposed uh, DOE ruling, it threatens the existence of Butler Works and Zanesville Works and we as Cliffs, although we know that, appreciate the fact that DOE has listened to us, has came out to our plant, and has taken the time to really dig into what we do as a steel mill. And I'm gonna try to explain some of that this evening. We're hopeful that this final rolling will provide us a path for continued use on GOES product, and that we can save our plant, our jobs, our town, and most importantly, as Congressman Kelly said, our country. Because honestly, without it, we become dependent on foreign material. And if we become dependent on foreign material and we are no longer here, it's game over. So we as a group need to stick together and continue to fight this. I'm gonna take a few minutes here this evening and I'm gonna go through a presentation uh, first off, uh, we always have to put our forward-looking statements out there, so we'll skip through that slide pretty quickly. But uh, what I do want to do is take a little bit of time and explain, you know, what we talk about when we uh, explain um, our grain-oriented electrical steels. So we have a couple different kind of materials that we make. We make an RGO, a regular grain-oriented, and we make a TCH product. Uh, the grain-oriented electrical steel is designed for applications that we use. It's a uh, linear magnetic field, 
And basically, it's a stationary product. So it's a machine, but it's not meant to go anywhere. Uh, that's why your transformers are stationary. We also have non-oriented electrical steels. We call them nose. And we make two products there. Uh, we make our conventional nose, which is designed for uh, rotating equipment, motors, and they're primarily less than 60 hertz. We also uh, make a EV grade electrical steel, and it's a Dimax M grade, and it's also a Motormax HF grade. That is greater than 60 hertz, and it's for high speed, variable frequency drives, such as the cars that are on the road today. <clears throat> So as we talk about this evening, here's really the nuts and bolts of it. Butler Works and Zanesville Works. Our most important asset, everybody in here that works for the plant, did work for the plant, will continue to work for the plant. We have 1,200 employees right now, all UAW at the Butler Works. We have 200 at Zanesville, also UAW employees. Many are second and third generation employees, including myself, and I know Jamie, and I'm sure there's many, many more out here. Our investments, over the last 12 years, $300 million has been invested uh, at the Butler Works. 59 of that for the electrical expansion projects. And over $22 million has been put in our facility to prevent impacts to our environment. $30 million this year alone has been invested in the Zanesville plant. And that is for the expansion of the Motormax product. We have restarted number one in Neil and Pickle, and we have also restarted number one Z mill. So our applications for our transformers, if you look at the one that's on the left, that is a pole transformer. And interestingly enough tonight, I took a, a look going home because it really settles in. I think I counted 60 some transformers just on North Road alone, a couple miles going across to my house. And as you guys and gals all see as you look out there, there's hundreds and hundreds of these things everywhere. The one on the right side is a power transformer, and I'll explain these in a little bit more detail for those that don't understand it. If you look at the uh, transformer uh, supply chain, it starts out as a coil. I'm not gonna go through the whole process, don't wanna bore everybody. But we take those coils and we split them into precise sizes for uh, our customer orders. At that point in time, they either go to a stacked core uh, lamination or they go to a wound core lamination. Your stack cores, which you see in the center, um, actually get formed into a round core assembly, which you'll see in the top right. And those stacked laminations are TCH product and those go into your big power transformers uh, that you'll see primarily coming right out of your power plants and also stepping down before they go into the smaller transformers or your distribution transformers. The distribution transformers bottom left of the screen on the right side, those can style, or oftentimes you'll see them as pad transformers. Those are wound cores, RGO product, and they are on the far bottom right. You can see what that core looks like. Also behind me, and please feel free tonight at any time, you can come up and you can take a look at a cutaway of a transformer that's sitting up here on stage. We wanted to bring that so you could get a look at it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the grid and power generation. So what is power? Well, power is watts. And it's a real simple calculation. It's uh, power equals amperage times voltage. And why, why is that important? Well, if you have 50 volts and two amps, you do the math, it's 100, right? So power is 100. Well, you could do it the other way too. You could have 50 amps and two volts, it's still 100 watts. Well, the purpose of a transformer is to be able to transform the power so that we can send it out to everybody to utilize most efficiently. So if you look at this diagram, it doesn't matter how the power is generated, whether it's wind, uh, solar, uh, nuclear, hydroelectric, whatever it may be, that power plant generates the power. Then we need to move it. And how many of you in here have little space heaters. You either have them in your home, your office. Well, everybody knows, how's the space heater work? You turn it on, it creates resistance, it gets red hot, your heat comes. Well, that's inefficiency. So what the transformer is doing is it's taking that amperage out and it's going to boost it up, get the voltage very high, high voltage lines that you see, and it can then broadcast that power a long distance 
very efficiently. Otherwise, the, the lines above your head would be glowing red and you'd be losing you know, a lot of energy. So we use a large power transformer. Uh, we transport it um, at a very high voltage. And then we get into a small and a medium power transformer and we start to back it back down. And at that point in time, the uh, transmission lines are like 2,000 to 40,000 volts. We then trans, uh, transfer that over to a pole transformer or your RGO uh, material. And then we can knock that down to be able to be utilized in your homes, your businesses, or in this case, for charging your electric vehicles, where that's where you can see the new uh, nose product that we're using right now for the cars uh, in this uh, diagram. And that's really a basic um, diagram and, and illustration of what we do and, and why we do it. So the DOE's proposed rule, it would eliminate the last domestic producer of GOES. That's us. So on January 11th, 2023, the US Department of Energy, the DOE, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking. And this rule was pertaining to the efficiency for the liquid immersed distribution transformers, such as the one off to my left on the stage here, low voltage dry type transformers and medium voltage dry type distribution transformers. The proposed standard would require covered transformers to be redesigned and all manufacturing lines to be retold to support the transformer cores. Uh, and then we'd be using amorphous material. So I'm gonna stop real quick and I'm gonna come over and I'm gonna grab a couple samples here and we're gonna share them. So I'm gonna start these around the room. Some of you have seen them, that's fine. If not, that's okay. I will say they're taped, be careful. Don't want anybody cut tonight, but this is real steel. This is our steel. And this is TCH. Made here, Butler, that's right. So you'll be able to see the actual grains uh, in this material, and this is what we make each and every day, and we make very good, very efficient transformers out of. This is amorphous material. Quite honestly, it's damaged already, and I've tried to be very careful with it, but I am gonna pass this around. But the, the real story here with this is, this is a 009 product. This is a triple O9 product. And we'll get into this a little bit more here as I talk about the amorphous material. But the reality behind it is, let's think about this. You gotta have 10 sheets of this to equal one sheet of this. 10 sheets to one sheet. So the problem's gonna be, when you try to make it, it's gonna take you twice as long. And then we'll get into a little bit later on that it takes a lot more of this to be able to do what these do. So I'm gonna start these around the room uh, and please pass them carefully. You can get a little look at them. Okay, so kind of back at it here. So, you know, in a press release from the DOE, uh, they did state that almost all transformers produced under the new standard would feature amorphous steel cores. You'll see what that is as it's coming around here. Here's the problem. Nearly 70% of the GOES product that we make is distribution transformer cores. RGO product right behind you sitting on the stage going into each and every home that's still being processed and made today. According to the rule as proposed, um, this would go into effect in 27. And fundamentally, it will destroy us economically to where we cannot sustain making this product. That's 1,400 jobs at risk between Butler and Zanesville. And uh, again, we are truly hopeful that the DOE is uh, responsive and I know they're listening to us. So hopefully we can uh, see this uh, rule uh, change or be improved. So implications. Amorphous material, we're gonna call it AM, is not produced in sufficient quantities. So it only serves 5% of the domestic market right now. And it's produced from 100% imported billets. That's right. Nobody in this place, nobody in this country, nobody in this state, nobody anywhere makes it. It comes in from overseas. Amorphous metal is categorized as a glass, not a metal. And you'll see that as it's going around here. Transformer manufacturers favor the use of GOES. We just talked about that. Could you imagine having to retool all of the equipment that you had and all of our uh, customers needing to make the change to be able to handle this material? I'm going to tell you right now, if you order a transformer today, it's 120 weeks, if not more, to be able to get a transformer. 120 weeks. So it's not us making the material that's the problem. 
They can't make them fast enough. That's where the real issue is. So failure to provide uh, for uh, continued use of GOES uh, threatens the objectives of our bipartisan infrastructure law and our Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, this proposed rule came about as Cleveland Cliffs was beginning to, er, to uh, be approached by the DOE um, to look for increasing production. And we did get to meet with them. Uh, they came in, they sat with us, and we clearly showed that we have the ability to make additional material. As a matter of fact, our Zanesville plant has a lot of idle units uh, that we could bring back online and make more material. And I can, I can tell you this, and you guys all see it, all the transformers that are out there on the poles today, they've been there as long as you can remember. How often do you see somebody getting up and changing a transformer, putting a new one up? You just don't. They last, they're dependable, they do their job. Further investments from Cliffs um, at Butler and Zanesville, honestly, been on hold since January 23. We know where we want to go. We know what we want to do. We want to invest. But honestly, you can't do it until you can be sure that we're going to be a sustainable company and we'll have a future. So let's talk about um, the DOE standards, just so everybody knows. And many of you may, but wanted to make sure I covered it. So the Energy Policy Act of 1992 amended the EPCA and directed the DOE to regulate distribution transformers. So if you look to the right table, here's the importance about that. In 2010, the 50 kVA efficiency, that's a size transformer, was at 99.08%. Yeah, that's right, 99.08%, pretty efficient. The 2016 rolling, moved that efficiency standard to 99.11%. Now when that happened, you see that little yellow portion there in RGO? What happened was that started to impact us already. The RGO product, which was what we used to call glass film, and as I look out around the room here, there's many people that know that, we don't run very much of that anymore. We were forced out of it, we had to force ourselves to be better, and we did. We improved the product and we primarily make what we call an M3X product now in RGO and we were able to sustain, but we hurt ourselves, we lost business. TCH continued on and it was profitable and stayed that way at, at the 99.11. The current proposed plan to roll out in 27 would take us 6X from the prior change. That would put us at 99.29% and like we talked about, at that point, it's game over. We can't make that product. Now here's the sad part about it. If you look at the bottom portion, when you talk about the electrification of vehicles, our heating, uh, data centers, you know, everybody that sends uh, your pictures to the cloud, well, it's not the cloud. It's going to a huge data center, taking a lot of power. And what's going on is, take a look at that bottom right chart. This sums it all up for everybody to see. Amorphous materials, once you get to 50% load, fall off dramatically. They cannot take the loading that our transformers do. So here's the, here's the sad part about it. As we move forward and we make a product, and you can see it right there, our transformer falls off much slower when it's 50% loaded. And I'm gonna tell you, most of them are well over 50% loaded because anybody that's out there doing the right thing from a business wants to use fewer transformers. They don't wanna just keep putting more of them out there. So that in itself tells the primary story. Amorphous is not the way to go, never will be. Load impacts, just what we talked about. If you look at uh, amorphous transformers and what the DOE's faulty assumptions were, if you take a look at the blue line on the bottom, that's our 2020 uh, power consumption. And it's going to have peaks and valleys, higher loads when you're running your air conditioners, your heaters, uh, depending on the time of day. Um, obviously, many of us that have worked at the mill, we all know that we've had to take curtailment. We actually shut the lines down so that we can make sure that people at home have power to take a shower, turn the lights on, cook their meals, do whatever it is. So we don't have enough capacity right now and if you take a look at where we're gonna be in 2040, it is significantly higher. So we're gonna have more frequent peaks, we're gonna have a higher base load, and amorphous materials is not gonna survive. The other side of it is, if you really look at that material, and the reason I passed it around is uh, so you could really get a feel for it, and I'm sorry, it'll take a while to get around here, but it's very flimsy. If it takes a shock load or it takes a hit, unlike your normal transformers, 
it won't survive. So it's definitely not the direction for us to be moving. Support of uh, higher efficiency transformers. We want to be there, and we'll continue to do that as Cliffs. We had recent investments on our Trancor uh, product at uh, 26 Car Lane on Hilltop. We just finished investing $4 million into a laser upgrade for that line. We had a YAG laser, which is essentially a grown crystal laser, and we have switched that line over to a fiber laser. When we switched over to the fiber laser, we were able to run our four millimeter spacing on our lines, and I'm going into the weeds here a little bit, but what we're doing is the sample coming around where the grain, you say the grains, if you take a laser and you slice those grains, basically put a line through them, the electrons can flow faster through that it's easier to get across. So it's easier to run 50 yards on a football field than it is 100 yards. So when you do that, it increases your efficiency. Well, we were able to put those four millimeter spaced lines and we were able to increase that line speed up to 600 feet a minute. Fastest line in the world, making the best product in the world. And that was a $4 million investment. Looking into 24, we're looking to take the next steps on our TCH product. And we've already done that. One of our customers, uh, Ermco, had asked for some changes, we did that. So we can still continue to invest and improve this product, but it doesn't happen overnight. We need time to get there. We can do some potential alloy process development and further enhance uh, Trancor H as we go. And we're planning potential investments in our slab uh, mill, which is induction heating. So for those of you that are in the uh, Butler Works and you know it and you see it when you drive past the four big stacks that everybody sees, that's our hot mill. You know, those furnaces originally started out as oil burning furnaces years ago. Now they're gas fired. Our proposed plan is to put four induction reheat furnaces in using electricity and heating our bars more evenly, faster, elimination of our holes that are generated by our pusher furnaces and uh, the best part about it is when we do that, we'll actually cut our greenhouse gas intensity by 75%. So we're very, very pleased and proud that uh, we uh, have been selected as a project here in Butler to have a grant of $75 million to be able to go towards that project. The entire project is about 192 uh, million. So we are very, very lucky that uh, we can get a $75 million grant. The problem is, we can't utilize that grant unless we get a favorable rolling. Got to get a favorable rolling. Got to save 1,200 jobs. Got to save another 200 in Zanesville. I really appreciate your time this evening. I appreciate the turnout here. We personally thank uh, the DOE for taking the time to listen to us. And we're cautiously optimistic that uh, we'll get a change in this. But as Congressman Kelly said, until we see it written down and it's signed, we got to keep fighting. So, appreciate it. First of all, I want to thank the BC3 for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. This is the number one community college for so many years. and. Uh, uh, it's just kind of what we expect in Butler, and it, uh, it never lets us down. So BC3, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. <laughs> We've asked you to submit some questions, and, and, and before I do that, I just want to really tell you, it's not through lack of effort. Uh, our quest from the Department of Energy started in April of 2023. Uh, in November of 2023, uh, we wrote another letter to Secretary Granholm. Um, in January 31st of 2024, we introduced HR 7171, the Distribution Transform Efficiency and Supply Chain Rehability Act. Uh, we got a very nice letter. We got a very nice letter. The letter that we submitted on November the 8th, 2023, it started off, and this is from Ms. Granholm. Thank you for your letter, dated November 8th, 2023, to Secretary Granholm. 
expressing your concerns about the state of the transformer supply chain in the Department of Energy's proposed distribution transfer, transformer energy conservation standards rulemaking. I am responding on behalf of Secretary Granholm. Uh, thank you, Secretary. Uh, you sent me a letter four months after I requested you to get involved. It gets a little frustrating. It gets a little frustrating. I have people tell me all the time, well, you better do something about it, Kelly. You better do something about it. I said, well, okay, you understand the difference between a rule and a law. This rule was not proposed by the Congress. This came out of the DOE. And we had trouble with the previous administration when it came to trade and the amounts of steel that were coming into our country. And we thought, you know what, somebody better stand up and stop this. So we got, we got some positive reaction from the previous administration. With this administration, it was altogether different. This was about a law that they instituted and somebody asked a question about it. And one of the questions here tonight, because I think this is really important. Are the people making this rule bureaucrats? Yes. What's the difference between me and them? They're appointed, you all elected me. We got at least one more vote than whoever it was running against us at the time. So this comes from the bureaucrats. This does not come from your elected body. This does not come from your representatives. This comes from the current administration that is wrongheaded on this stuff. It says, can they be held accountable? Yeah, by doing what you're doing tonight. You're the ones that make it accountable. If we let it go and do nothing, they will say the people must be okay with it. They didn't even complain. They didn't even stand up and say anything. Well, no, those days are over. We're not sitting back and ever losing this steel, this town, this country by bureaucrats who were not elected, and I bet most of them never served in our armed services. This is another one. Is there anyone that we know that supports this rule? The current administration. They have fingers in both ears and they've kept their mouth shut. They keep telling us, you people have to settle down. You don't know what's best for you. Let us tell you. Can I tell you something, the people I serve with? They've been politicians their whole life. They've never had to punch a clock. They've never had to go out at night. They haven't had to work shifts. They haven't had to go what every one of us go through every single day to put bread on the table, a roof over the head of our kids and clothes on their back and give them a chance at a better life. You don't need people like this making rules for you. That's not who we are. And pardon me if I get a little bit emotional about this, but I'm not going to allow at least what I can do to sit back and allow this to happen to our town and to our country. It's just wrong. It's flat out wrong. I told you earlier, a million and a half men and women in uniform died to allow us to assemble like this. Can Congress do anything to intervene? I said, yes. All you have to do is look around the room. This is when the American people stand up for themselves. They don't need a politician to speak for them. We have the guts to stand up to anything that's ever been in our way because we know it's the way of life that we know and we love. And the rest of the world envies us envies us. We are the first responder anytime anything goes wrong in the world. It's always America. It's always America. It's always America. And it will continue to be always America as long as Americans stand up and say enough. So that's up to us to do that. So yes, you, here is something we can do and that's what we're doing tonight. What can we do as citizens to make our voices heard? Demand that this rule be taken down. I've already been told you shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff because it can be offensive. My question is, who's offended when we stand up for who we are, who we've always been, and what one and a half, one, 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 one half million men and women have died to preserve? How could we sit back and be silent? You being here tonight is huge. If amorphous steel is only more efficient, below 50% load, won't this be worse as electrification, electrification grows. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. You heard what Aaron said. I mean, it's not that hard to understand once you are given the opportunity to learn about it. It's when we don't know that we get hurt. What are the national security concerns? 
How many of you in here had COVID? Right? Right? Who was it we were depending on China. to help us get through COVID? China. China. The same people that started it are going to help us get better, but only, only if they take care of themselves first. And the ones over there that they couldn't take care of, they just don't talk about. I mentioned earlier, we just came through the Easter season. We know what sacrifice is about. We know what our moms and dads, what our grandmas and grandpas, was the greatest generation, what they did, not only to save the United States of America, but to save the world. How can we not stand when we know this rule is not American? It is going to be up to you. And I can't thank 3303 for being here tonight. I, uh, you can get emotional about this. What started in the early 1900s and has gone through several different ownerships, but it's always been the same. The strongest people in the world stood up to do the best job they could to make the greatest product the world has ever known, and that's American steel. I just tell you this, please put your foot down. Put your foot down. Do not allow this to happen on your watch. All those before us didn't allow it to happen on their watch, and they preserved it for us. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, Aaron. Great job, Jamie. You know, all of you guys, you know, you know how important you are to us. Uh, without you, we can't do it. So I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. And, and I would hope at the end of the night, uh, take a moment when you kneel down to thank all those who came before us to make it possible to have nights like this. You know, you can't do this anyplace else in the world. You know that, right? This is not about Democrats and Republicans. This is about Americans. Let's all stand up. Let's stand up. Let's continue to be free. Let's contribute to be that light that the rest of the world looks at and only wish they could be. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. It's America. It's America. I expect this. I also expect you when you leave here tonight, excuse me, you're not invited to come up at the podium, but you are invited to be here and to hear what's going on. I'm not doing this for me. I could care less for me, my family. I'm doing it for the country. I'm doing it for this town. I'm doing it for this steel mill. If you find a problem with that, then that's okay. That's okay. That's America. You can do that. Anyway, other than that, for tonight, it's, uh, it's time to say good night. If any of you want to stay around and talk with each other, please do. Uh, we're open all the time. The staff is with you over here. This is, uh, this is one, two, three, four. This is six of the 15, 16 people that support you. But they are your staff. They are not my staff. They are your staff. Anything we can do to help you in the future, please do. But pay attention. Let's just keep paying attention. Thank you so much. God bless. Good night. Things change. One thing you can count on is that Armstrong always will be Armstrong. We've stood by our name from our humble beginnings in 1946 through the millions spent expanding fiber broadband in our communities. We've never changed our name to run from our reputation. We've established trust by simply putting our people, customers, and services first. It's a practice that holds true and will continue at Armstrong.